Friends, good morning. Grace to you and peace. In the name of God, our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, it's truly a joy to have you joining us for our digital worship this morning, September 19th. As we begin, I want to say a special thank you to Michelle for uh, doing me a solid in, in doing some video recording of our music today. And uh, she stepped in when my schedule kind of got pinched and, and helped out in a big way. I also want to say thanks to Rod Turpin for being our lay reader today uh, on short notice. He was able to help us out. So I really do appreciate the help that this congregation continues to provide uh, for ourselves and support for one another uh, during this time that we are uh, limited to digital worship. Uh, but it is in digital worship that I hope you come to this time this morning as we come to God with a, a true desire to be in God's presence, a true desire to have God shape us in worship. One of the songs we will sing today is As the Deer, and it's uh, words from the Psalms that say, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Friends, indeed, may our worship be something that we approach with that sort of desire this morning. And as we begin, may we offer this prayer of invocation for our time together. Holy God, you have promised that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And so in this time, we ask that you would prepare our hearts and prepare our minds that we might receive your wisdom, that we might come to understanding the world from your perspective. May our time of worship be a time that our bodies are relieved and our souls are refreshed, that the desires and the cravings that we seek are your desires and cravings, not the ones shaped by this world. We offer this prayer that we might be filled with your peace. And we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that our worship might be joyful, that our worship might be authentic, that our worship might bear good fruit in our lives with our neighbors. Friends, will you join us in this morning's call to worship, led by Rod Turpin. Good morning, everyone. If you would, please join me in today's call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Make known God's deed among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord's strength and presence continually. Praise God, whose judgments are all in the earth. Our first hymn this morning is Breathe on the Breath of God.
It is one of the humbling common threads that we share as human beings, but the reality for all of us is that we are all sinners. In fact, Scripture affirms and reminds us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But that same portion of scripture goes on to say that if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and God who is just will forgive us our sins and cleanse our unrighteousness. And so now as we seek God's forgiveness, may we unite our voices in a unison prayer before God and our neighbors praying together. Spirit of God, we confess that we put on errors more often than we put on the armor of God. We are guilty of girding ourselves with lies instead of the truth. We try to protect ourselves with arrogance, superstition, and self-reliance instead of righteousness, faith, and your gift of salvation. Our footsteps do not follow your path of peace, and we are quick to use your word to attack one another instead of striking out against the sins we personally commit. Forgive us, holy God. Gift us with the wisdom and strength to change our ways so that we might live as your faithful ambassadors of the good news. Amen. Friends, indeed, Scripture reminds us as well in the famous verse of John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the gospel's thought continues in the next verse saying, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And so believe, hope, and trust in this message of salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. If you would, please bow your heads with me for our prayer of illumination. Holy and gracious God, May your Holy Spirit give us a spirit of wisdom and knowledge so that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for those who believe. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Psalms. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees, planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this is the word of the Lord. Grace be to God. Good morning. Today, we're going to talk about school and some of the subjects you like or may not like. I have some math problems in front of me, and I'm sure that you all can answer these, two plus two or six minus two. Now, math, to solve a problem, it takes wisdom. You have to think about it. Now, I really didn't like math that much when I was in school. How about you? Do you like math? What subjects do you enjoy at school? I really liked English or reading. I wonder what your favorite subjects are. Now, math, like I said, takes wisdom. Anything at school will take wisdom and intelligence, but there's another kind of wisdom that is very important, and it's found in another type of book, in the Bible. Now, the wisdom that comes in this book, it says the wisdom comes from above. It is pure, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And that's in the book of James 3, verse 17. Now there was a lot of big words in there, I know that. Without a trace of partiality, that means that you treat everyone the same. 
hypocrisy. You don't say something and then do something different. God gives us intelligence that is from above. It's not the earthly intelligence that we get from school. It's intelligence that he gives us from above. And he wants us to use it to make peace with people around us, to show his love to people, to be gentle, to be merciful and kind. And he doesn't want us to play favorites. Now think about a situation you may be in at school. Maybe you're out on the playground and someone trips one of your friends or does something mean to one of your friends and then they start laughing. What are you going to do to help solve that problem? You need to use your intelligence or wisdom from above that God gives to show kindness and mercy to everyone. Now, it's important to be wise at school with our school subjects, but it's just as important to ask God to help us, to give us his heavenly wisdom. Because the Bible says, also in the verse of book of James, I'm sorry, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's in James 4, 8. And that would be a good verse for you to memorize this week. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James 4, 8. Remember that God gives us wisdom to help show others how much we really care about them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, help us to always try our best in school, but help us to remember to ask you for your heavenly wisdom in everything we do and say, amen. Friends, this morning our reading comes from the third and fourth chapters of the book of James, beginning in the third verse in the 13th chapter, where we read these words. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Friends, this concludes this morning's reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Teleportation. Teleportation is the answer to the question my daughter gives me when I ask what superpower would you have if you could have any that there are? What superpower would you choose? What if we narrowed it down to two choices only and you could only have one of two superpowers? The choices would be invisibility or the power of flight. Which power of those two would you choose? Would you rather fly free in the sky like Superman? Or would you rather be able to turn invisible like the comic book hero, the Invisible Woman of the Fantastic Four. Now, whichever power you pick, remember, you will be the only person in the whole world to have this particular superpower. It will be unique to you and you alone. And you can't choose both. It's one or the other or simply none at all. Defining these uh, superpowers a little more clearly. To be clear, invisibility means the power to become transparent. It will include your clothing, but anything you pick up will remain visible to onlookers. And defining flight a little further, it means that you have the power to fly at any altitude within the Earth's atmosphere. 
speeds that you could travel would be up to 1,000 miles per hour. You don't get to be invulnerable. You don't get super strength. You simply get to fly. So which superpower of those two would you choose, flight or invisibility? And now that you have chosen your superpower, what do you do with it? How will you handle this most powerful responsibility that you possess? I've referred to the study in the program before, and you might recall me bringing it to mind. But a while back on NPR, on a program called The American Life, John Hodgman conducted an informal, meaning unscientific, study uh, asking the question, which is better, the power of flight or the power of invisibility? And what he found surprised him. It surprised him because no matter which power people chose, they said that after choosing it, they would use it in ways that were self-serving. In fact, the actions that people said they would do and perform with these superpowers were most often never even close to being heroic, not even, in some cases, simply kind. You see, Hodgman found that those he interviewed were unapologetic and inventing schemes that they happily shared and uh, gave voice to in responding to him. All of these people relied on their new superpowers not to serve their fellow man, but to acquire their personal desires, be they material or physical. Typically, this is how the responses would go. People who turn invisible would like to do things like sneak into the movies or steal expensive clothing from fine department stores. They want to do things like spy on their coworkers, maybe stalk their exes, maybe even hang around the showers a little bit possibly eavesdrop on conversations where they are the subject matter, or maybe slip onto airplanes for free rides, kind of offsetting the fact that they traded the power of flight for invisibility. But almost everyone he spoke with referred to invisibility as kind of being a sneaky sort of power. People who chose flight would be people who would do things like stop taking the bus. They'd give up their automobiles. They want to go check out clubs in the club scene by flying in and out, maybe hoping to impress the ladies a little bit by doing so. They would fly off to exotic places. So you get people like the superhero who dubbed himself the flying to Paris guy. <laughs> would you choose Paris? maybe Prague, maybe Rio, you fill in the blank for your own desires. Choose your destination. And Hodgman's survey indicated that flight might be considered the superpower of those who are more arrogant and narcissistic. Such desires as these, whether it's stealing clothing from a fine department store or looking for a one-night stand, are decidedly earthly and essential uh, essentially, they are categorized as deeply unspiritual. Predominantly, the interviewees are all self-serving in their application and use of their superpower. And having obtained their personal superpower, they may choose to use it only on themselves for their own good, for their own in, uh, justification or edification. Here's something that hardly anybody ever mentioned in his interviews. I will use my power for others. I will use my power to fight crime. You see, no one seemed to care about crime or justice. Nobody wanted to work for peace. Nobody wanted to work for um, things that are better about or, or bettering the world locally or worldwide. No one wanted to be merciful. No one apparently even wanted to be just plain helpful. And Hodgman wondered why no one wanted to take down organized crime or bring hope to the hopeless or swear vengeance on the underworld, even if just a smidgen, even if just a little bit.
Some of the more telling feedback comes from a participant in the study who refers to himself as the flying to Paris guy. Uh, we've already heard reference to that name. But in his response, he commented, I don't think I'd want to spend a lot of my time using my power for good. And he goes on to say, I, I mean, if I don't have super strength and I'm not invulnerable, it would be very dangerous for me to help others. If you had to rescue somebody from a burning building, you might catch on fire. Just having the power of flight, I don't think it's necessarily quite enough because you don't have super strength. I'd still be weak when I got there. I don't fight crime now. Well, guess what, Mr. Flying to Paris guy? You're no superhero. But his answer is, again, a telling reminder about where our hearts might be all too often. It might be a representative reaction that all of us have if we're honest with ourselves. Right now, we might not have the heart or the wisdom to do what is good and what is right. Right now, we might, when possible, use our superpowers to orchestrate personal and private gain for ourselves or wreak havoc on others just for fun or maybe to get that revenge we're after. Nobody interviewed on this American Life program that I reference took responsibility for others less fortunate for themselves by using their superpowers and their super abilities for the common good. They all turned inward. Helping the underdog, saving that proverbial drowning puppy or kitten stuck in a tree, beating up the bad guys, it appears that no one, no one is interested in these sorts of actions. I guess this tells us that most people secretly, and when participating in certain studies, even openly, have oodles and oodle, oodles of selfishness. It's not a surprise to you and me, I don't think. This is what we call the wisdom of the world. Now, the Apostle James knows this about us, he knows that we all have this common level of selfishness and this powerful set of human cravings. Again, these aren't cravings like when Michelle was pregnant with Caroline and I had to go to Long John Silver's to get the Krispies and then go to Burger King to get the cherry Coke slush. No, these are cravings of a different sort because well, we may, with our cravings, successfully conceal our private jealousies or our desires and envies from others, but ultimately these cravings are, as James points out, a destructive, even devilish wisdom. Devilish wisdom. That's an interesting phrase, is it not? So, for us, having superpowers doesn't change what? Well, ultimately, it doesn't change our integrity and our character. Actually, by using our superpowers, we might end up revealing our true character to be less than giving. It might not be so pretty if it comes down to it. The superpower, though, that we need, James says, is this. Wisdom. Wisdom. And James refers to it and, and calls it wisdom from above. It happens throughout Scripture that this word is used. In, in the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, it is Sophia. And in our New Testament, it is in the Greek language, Pneuma, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. In Proverbs, we read that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in the Psalms, it is meditation on the law of God. Earlier in this writing from James, in the first chapter of the fifth verse, it is something for which we should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And then from today's reading, we read that it is something from above. That is true wisdom. And it's characterized by purity and peacefulness, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, 
without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. You see, true wisdom yields a harvest of righteousness, we read. In other words, what James is arguing is that you and I can talk all we want about being smart, about being wise, about being powerful, but unless our lives bear witness to good works, none of us are wise at all. In fact, we might be those folks that are about as bright as a burnt out light bulb, as the saying goes. Who is wise and understanding among you? We are asked. And the answer or the further comment is show your good life that your works are done with gentleness and born of wisdom. False wisdom. False wisdom, says James, is something altogether different. It's an entire, entirely different category. Characteristics of false wisdom include bitter envy and selfish ambition. It's referred to as earthly, spiritual, and downright devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, he says, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. And additionally, it's characterized as resulting in conflicts, disputes, and cravings in the Christ body. So what are we to do? Well, lucky for us, James is never... Um, short on giving advice when it comes to practical matters. And James, in a sense, says, you want to be mighty? You want to be truly wise? You want to be truly powerful? Well, here's what you can do. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands and humble yourselves before the Lord. So how do we do these things? Well, it starts for you and for me with taking some time to listen and pay attention and discern. I'm listening to Pandora radio these days, and I will most often select a channel that goes back to, uh, yeah, this is funny, the big hair bands of the 80s. Yes, right, I point to my head like there's even hair to represent big hair but I like to listen to music from my teen years and this is uh, always going to include uh, music from the 80s and, and most likely the big hair bands but it doesn't matter which band I choose to start this uh, kind of um, music selection uh, it bounces around from band to band but choosing different bands from the 80s it, it's always true that somewhere in that mix, the song Africa by Toto is going to come uh, to, to, onto the playlist. And maybe it's not Toto by Africa. These days it might be Toto, Toto uh, or Africa sung by Weezer. Uh, Weezer remade this song a couple years ago and it recirculated the popularity of uh, the music from both artists. And so now when I hear the song Africa, I listen closely I listen closely to see if I can tell if it's Weezer or Toto playing the song. They're, they're very similar with some uh, electronic uh, sound difference in, in portions of the song. But I simply say all that to say I hear it and I try to discern the differences because it is a part of what I'm listening to. It's what I'm tuned into. And there, as I'm tuned into my 80s music and Africa becomes part of what I'm hearing, I can focus more intently on what it is. I mention all of this about my Pandora radio listening habits to say that the same is true with wisdom. When we are listening, when we know what we are paying attention to, we have the opportunity to, to discern on a deeper level what is exactly is being spoken by what we know to be the wisdom of the voice of God. Submit yourselves to God. We know how to do this when we're listening intently. Resist the devil. We know how to do this when we are tuned in. Draw near to God. 
we are aware of ways to make this happen when we are paying attention to these details. Cleanse your hands. Again, when we listen, when we pay attention, we understand how this is going to come to take shape in our lives. And humble yourselves before the Lord. Again, unless we are willing to take time to invest in listening, to, the, to discern the will of God, we will not fully understand how to do this in effective and practical ways. Unless our inner focus shifts from the earthly to the spiritual, we will wreak havoc in our own lives. We will wreak havoc in the lives of others in our world. You see, without superpowers, we're able to do sufficient damage. As humans, we have tendencies to brag and covet and murder. We are hypocrites. We argue and quarrel and we create conflicts. It's part and parcel of our nature. But with the gift of holy wisdom and with the gift of God's transformation, we can learn. We can learn to live the lives that God calls us to live today and always as brothers and sisters as servants of Christ. Thanks be to God today and always. Amen and amen.
Friends, as we turn to God in prayer, it's not uncommon for you to hear me saying something like, may we bow our hearts and heads together. But I'm not going to ask you to bow your hearts and heads uh, as our prayer begins today. It's not a matter of being irreverent, but I want your eyes to be on the screen so that we might unite our hearts and voices in our prayer today using the model of the prayer of St. Francis. So may we pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Holy God, we thank you indeed for these words that serve as a wonderful model of a prayer that we can take to heart and live by. Certainly we do so today with the many concerns that we have. Hear us now as we pray for some of those concerns, as we name members of our church family and extended family. In their situations, will you be with and help Mary and Kara, Morris and Teresa, Terry and Ray and Bethany, Anne and Janice, Carolyn, Faye and Tuddy, Jerry, Sue, and Molly, Gary and Frank, Sam and Tammy, Kevin and Pat, Sylvia, Michael, Wendell and Nolan, the Rudzicks, Raina, Lacey, Debbie, Mary and Joanne. As well, we pray that you be with Mary Ellen and Kay, Mary Jo and Cless, our own congregation, our own home presbytery, those serving in our troops at home and abroad, for the Higbees and the Smiths. Again, we pray for those dealing with situations from our broader news stories, the events still in the aftermath of Afghanistan, tragedies in Haiti and the southern United States and the Northeast United States with additional effects from recent hurricanes and storms. Again, as we are well aware of our community's needs, we pray for our healthcare workers at Taylor Regional Hospital and indeed the hospitals across our state and throughout the rural South. We pray for our emergency workers and our educators in our local school systems. Lord, we add to these the silent prayers of our own hearts, which we name before you in a quiet moment just now. And together we draw our prayer to its conclusion as we pray familiar words your son taught us. As he taught his disciples when they asked how to pray, he gave this model our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
friends, we're glad you took the opportunity to join us for worship this morning. And as you go from this time and place of worship, may you go knowing without a doubt the love of God, the agape love, the unconditional love of God. May you go knowing the mercy and forgiveness offered to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who offers us transformation in our lives. And may you go knowing the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit, which is alive and at work in your lives. May the knowledge of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit allow you to know an everlasting peace, a peace that passes understanding as you go about life as servants of a servant Lord, as hands and feet in the body of Christ. Go today and always in that peace. Amen and amen.